Well, thank you all so much for joining us for Don't Judge a Library by Its Building, Library Architecture and Design. Uh, there's more to a library than just shelves and books. Careful thinking and planning has informed the interior and exterior designs of libraries as they evolved from medieval stacks to modern community centers. This program will explore the good, the bad, and the amazingly innovative in library architecture with a focus on the last century. So today's uh, program is led by art historian Jane O'Neill, owner of Culturally Curious. Jane holds a master's in art history from BU and a master's in education from Harvard University Graduate School of Education. She is a New Hampshire native and has worked at some of uh, her state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director and the Curier Museum of Art, uh, where she held the role of senior educator. Uh, so all uh, 45 of us or so, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Jane for joining us here this morning. And Jane, you can take it away. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you so much. Robert, you're so good at what you do. And, um, and I think you probably inspire people to feel so close to their hometown libraries and, um, and maybe even prompt them to go off on vacations and visit libraries. And it feels like today we are in this virtual space of like-minded individuals that love to visit libraries. And that's just so exciting. So thank you everybody for taking time out of your day to learn a little bit more about this topic. This will be a really fun hour together. I saw the question in the chat, uh, what is the image on the screen? This is the Kansas City Public Library in Missouri. And it's called the Community Bookshelf. It actually extends off in the other direction as well, but this is a, a really good angle where you can see how they added texture to um, each of these book spines. And it's called the Community Bookshelf because they actually pulled the community to see um, which, which uh, titles were most significant to them, meant the most, which titles they'd like to have represented there. Now, we're not actually looking at the library itself. This is actually just a screen for the parking garage for the library, but it's so visually uh, pleasing. It's so much fun that it has become um, a destination uh, for anybody visiting Kansas City, for sure. So we're going to be, like Robert said, talking about the good, the bad, the innovative, the ugly. We're going to cover all of it and get a little bit of history along the way. I have a quick uh, personal preamble when it comes to libraries, because we've all had our personal experiences with libraries. And I got started with um, a, a um, uh, hold on just one second, please. I have uh, a door that's just opened here with a toddler who's peeking through. She's just getting pulled away. So I apologize if there's a little bit of sound here. So um, I had a personal experience with libraries from a very early age, as most of us had. But when I was just a teenager, I began working in my local public library, which we can see over here in the image on the on the left. This is the Carpenter Memorial Library in Manchester, New Hampshire. Here's an interior view of it. I was working as a page. I was shelving books and retrieving um, periodicals from the stacks. And um, I felt so privileged to work in such a beautiful building at such a young age. And so I continued on uh, working in different kinds of libraries when I was studying for my undergraduate degree and, uh, and my graduate degrees. I was working in slide libraries. So that meant I was helping to organize the images uh, that the professors were using in their slide lectures and, um, and reshelving those images once they were done. And I can say concretely that I wouldn't be doing the work that I'm doing now without this kind of preparation in terms of understanding understanding how you sequence images. So this was a huge help to me in my education, but slide libraries are completely a thing of the past. In fact, if you Google slide library, you know what comes up? An actual slide in a library. <laughs> so of course you can pull all images off the internet these days. So um, incidentally, this slide library is in somebody's home. Um, I think this is in South Korea. So just to catch us up on um, the next step in my illustrious career in libraries, after um, 
after college, I went on a tour. I was just kind of walking through Boston one day and I went on a tour of the Boston Public Library that was transformative to me. Um, I assume a lot of people who are with us today are probably from the greater Boston area. And if you've never been on the art and architecture tour of, of the main library building, I highly recommend it because they walk you through this, this barrel vaulted uh, reading room here, which is just so magnificent. And then various rooms are decorated by, uh, you know, some of the leading muralists of the day. This is a, a room that's painted by the artist Edwin Austin Abbey. But one of the spaces that I think really knocks people's socks off, at least it did for me, was the, the grand staircase inside the McKim building of the Boston Public Library. And, um, it's just, it's just covered with this yellow sienna marble that's been polished to a high finish. So the room feels golden with the right light in there. And then you have these two impressive lions. They're also made out of marble, but they are not highly polished. So there's, there's this kind of roughness to them. And they're like guardians. They're like the, the protectors of an ancient citadel, um, sort of signifying that, that, this, that this space that you're walking up to is rarefied it's precious. And I remember our tour guide pointed out to us that when you walk up the stairs and go behind these lines, people have been rubbing their rear ends for good luck for decades now. So those, those rear ends have been polished to a high shine. So make sure you, um, you touch those rear ends for good luck too. But the end of that tour, uh, well, it finished outside and we were standing uh, in, uh, in front of the front door of, of the library and the guide pointed out to us how it was written free to all above the door in stone. And, um, and he started sort of, you know, going on about how uh, this, this in so many ways represented a temple to democracy. He talked about how important it was to have an informed citizenry. That's really the foundation of democracy. He talked about the sacred right of access to information. And he made me feel like I was standing in front of the most sort of noble <laughs> institution one could imagine. And I will admit, I shed a tear or two. So, um, oh, incidentally, if you're wondering, this is uh, the goddess Minerva, who's the goddess of wisdom, who's right underneath that text there. So uh, just a few months later, when I had the opportunity, I... Um, I applied for a job at the Boston Public Library and I began working for, um, for the Boston Public Fo Library Foundation, which was a separate nonprofit, but it was there to help preserve the art and architecture of the building. So this has always been sort of, a, you know, a, a, a passion project for me. Uh, there's the Boston Public Library Fund now, it has a slightly different mission. So a few years after that, I went back to grad school, I got a master's in art history. I began teaching art history and working in museums. So I sort of left libraries for museums, but libraries continue to have this special place in my heart. They were, they still are, the temples of democracy that honestly library or museums, art museums wished they could be. Um, libraries, they're free and open to everyone. And of course, art museums have ever increasing admission prices, and they really struggle with this reputation of being kind of cold old and elitist and a little bit out of touch. So that being said, libraries and museums still have a lot in common, at least architecturally. Here in my hometown of Manchester, New Hampshire, the that wonderful library that I grew up working in uh, was designed by the same architect who um, designed our local art museum, the Courier Gallery of Art, which is now the Courier Museum of Art. So from a young age, I had this notion that, that these things are so interconnected. So so, um, so museums, art museums in particular, have always been designed to look like temples. They were uh, created, there was this building boom at the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, right in line with the boom of library building that, um, that was intended to elevate the masses. And so a lot has changed since that building boom. And so uh, we have these kind of relics. We have places like the Philadelphia Museum of Art that you see here that still looks like a temple and it's physically elevated. We've got this massive staircase leading up to it that is so physically inaccessible. This is the Rocky staircase where at the end of his workout, he runs up the stairs and then celebrates. But 
the the physical inaccessibility of this place also is linked to the uh, you know what some would consider the intellectual inaccessibility of these places so needless to say if somebody was going to design an art museum or a library today, any sort of place where you're thinking of community engagement, you wouldn't start with this model. So it's um, it's something that we see kind of lingering in the world of library architecture as well. This is just a random library out in Indiana. If anybody, um, if anybody grew up in Indiana and needs to know where it is, I'll let you know. But in recent years, especially since I started my company, Culturally Curious, I've been visiting more and more libraries, which I truly love. It's, it's a pleasure to do so. But the experience that I have again and again is I, I'm running up to this building, I'm halfway up the stairs, and then I encounter a sign on the door that says, go around to the back. <laughs> so many uh, American libraries were designed a hundred plus years ago that they're they're not oriented towards our the way we live our modern lives they're not oriented towards people who are driving up and parking down the street or in the back so um so it it, it extends this notion of physical inaccessibility intellectual inaccessibility that um that museums, art museums in particular, have been struggling with all along. So when we think of libraries in general, and these are two really beautiful examples in Massachusetts, we have the Pollard Public Library in Lowell, Mass, and then the Thomas Crane Memorial Library in Quincy, Mass, which somebody mentioned, this is one of the uh, several uh, libraries in Massachusetts designed by H.H. H. Richardson in this kind of Romanesque revival um, style here. I share these two images because um, they're beautiful, but also just for us to ponder for a moment this bigger question of are you know beautiful old libraries are they welcoming does the architecture which is a cousin to art museum architecture does it perform its most essential duty as not just a, a warehouse for for books and information and resource resources but does it welcome the public? Does it allow all of us access? So we'll be pondering these questions and more over the, the course of this next hour. Let me give you a sense in terms of how we're going to run through the information. We're going to get, get started on a brief um, history of library architecture. We're going to kind of fly through this and then turn our attention to innovation and experimentation. Uh, before we got started today, Robert and I were talking a, a lot about how, you know, in the past few decades, library architecture has has gotten really um, innovative. So, so we'll see some wild examples and then turn our attention to how there's some really interesting overlap today in how um, how interior spaces are designed inside libraries to be more playful, more engaging. And that's where we see some real cross-pollination from, from art museums and, and children's museums. All right, so let's get started here on this brief history. We're going to start off way back in classical antiquity. Um, we have over here an imagined rendering of, um, of the Library of Alexandria, which dates back to about 280 BC. And I bring in this image because just to get us oriented in terms of time and space, libraries as institutions date back even further than that. We know we we know of some dating back to almost 2000 BC, but the Library of Alexandria, which was um, heralded for being uh, so big, so beautiful, but also for its mission which was universal knowledge. So going that far back, thousands of years back, human beings had this inclination to share uh, knowledge and to house it in a precious place like this. An early still standing example of, um, of a library is over here on the right. This is an image from, um, from Turkey. This is the library at Celsus. And this dates to about 100 AD. So a couple hundred years after the library of Alexandria. And all that remains is just the front of the building, the facade. But what a facade. <laughs> this, so a library wasn't 
just some sort of humble undertaking here. Look at the human scale um, walking into this structure. I mean, you are supposed to be awed by it. It's flanked by all of these columns. We've got three central portals here and we have um, sculpture integrated into the design. And all of these sculptures had, um, had references to wisdom and knowledge and intelligence and that sort of thing. So just to, to quickly know, I mean, even back in ancient Rome, every library or every community really had its own library. And in, in the city of Rome itself, there were two dozen public libraries. So this is really at the heart of representative democracy too. So uh, libraries form, uh, of course, have been performing this essential function for thousands of years. We're going to zoom forward in history and now we are in medieval times. We are looking at the University of Oxford, Oxford and um, considering some medieval European precedents to our modern notion of libraries. This is the Merton Library Building, which is in the Mob Quadrangle at Oxford University. So this is the, the front of the library itself, which you can see is flanked by the tower over here. So it corresponds to this building that we see on the right. And this is not a big grand facade like we saw from ancient Rome. Um, it's not welcoming. This is literally closed off to the public. It's part of a university. But, um, but it's, it's a reminder to us that these books have to be protected, that there's power in this knowledge, but most importantly, that books were very expensive. They were some of the most precious objects that you could own at this time. So peeking inside uh, Oxford, I want to give you a sense in terms of how they were actually housing books right around the year 1300 um, in a giant chest with, um, with three different lots locks on it. This is a giant lock box here. It's a treasure chest. <laughs> it, and it's this good reminder that, um, that, that, that these objects were so rare and, um, and, and this early concept of a library was so different from our, our, our modern notion of a lending library. Now we're going to take a quick detour in this history. And I want to bring you over to Italy because chronologically, this is where it fits in. But a lot of our, our library history is going to be um, back in the UK. This is a quick stop in Italy to see a library that was designed by none other than Michelangelo. So this is the Laurentian Library designed in 1571. Uh, this was for the, the powerful merchant Medici family, very politically powerful in Florence, but they sort of wanted to prove that they were more than just merchants. They wanted to sort of um, make a testament to the fact that they were scholars, that they could be theologians. And so they invested in this library space. The library itself, you can see over here on the right, it looks a lot like a church design, doesn't it? It almost looks like there's just pews um, lined up over here. Uh, um, and you walk down this central aisle. It's almost as though you kneel down when you get there and, um, and say your prayers, but you're really sort of sitting at a lectern. Over on the left is really the most important element here that I wanted to share with you. This is the staircase that Michelangelo designed. He had this one intermediary space uh, to uh, provide steps up into the library. And he designs these almost otherworldly stairs to really signify that you're going into a rarefied realm here. They are, you can see that they're rounded uh, at, at, at the base here and that they are big, wide steps. It's almost like water pooling down and cascading around you. And then you can see that, that it's this almost kind of muscular form here with this undulating line. And these are low, shallow steps. And this entire antechamber here is just completely occupied by this staircase that leads you up into the library. So it's really kind of transforming not just your, your physical presence, but your mental presence to head into this space to do studying. So, um, so we can see that already 1500s, almost 1600s at this point, we have a notion of, of really the magic that can happen in terms of learning and study when people are in libraries. Now, heading back to the UK, I just wanted to show you how those lecterns those study lecterns, uh, quickly kind of transform. This is an example um, from Oxford as well. Uh, oh, wait, sorry. This is Trinity College at Cambridge. And it's not quite as elegant as the space that Michelangelo designed, but it's the same idea. It's, it's almost like church pews in many ways. 
with a place to sit and a place to read. But in this case, they're beginning to integrate uh, uh, stacks right there so that you can find the book that you need, sit down right there and read from it as well. I wanted to include this image over here on the right, just to give you a sense of the scale of these um, bookshelves. And then we get to our almost modern notion of modern open stacks with the images that we see here. We're back at Oxford. The lock boxes have been replaced by, by bookshelves. And these were among the first to be used in England. And they have the benches in between them. So you find the book yourself, you sit down and you read it right there. Uh, we're getting really close to our modern sense of library. So all of this dates to uh, the 16th century. Now, um, uh, there, this idea of, of just going and finding what you need has not always been consistent in libraries. I wanted to share with you a couple of images of uh, a famous chained library. And these are libraries that existed throughout Europe. But this is one, this is an example that has, um, has been consistent since, uh, since the 1600s. This is at Hereford Cathedral. And this is the, the largest surviving chained library in the world. World. So all of these books were kept under lock and key. We're looking at a library here that is in this, um, now in this modern building right outside of Hereford Cathedral. And so uh, the way this works is that the, the books are chained to a rod here. <laughs> so you don't take them anywhere. They are precious commodities. You can access them, but you certainly can't possess them. So if you're starting to feel bad for these poor chained books, just know that at about the same time, there were other innovations in terms of how books were stored and used and, um, and transported. We're looking at a 17th century Jacobian um, or Jacobian travel library. So this is a, a, a box here, but, but note the classical architecture that's included. It's as though the, the maker of the box wanted to suggest that it's its own actual little library structure. And it holds about 50 texts that would have been essential to, um, to one's education at the time. So there's theology, philosophy, classical history, classical poetry, all in these tiny little books. But you'd have to have really good eyesight to go through something like this imagine reading this by, by candlelight at night. So we do have a couple of instances of these uh, really treasured personal libraries. Napoleon himself had one of those. So as we move forward in history, we have these uh, remarkable advancements in terms of printing processes and books proliferate. They become much more widely accessible. They are not considered necessarily the most precious um, valuable objects that, that people can own. And uh, because because there are so many more books, the libraries get bigger and bigger. We're looking at the long room in um, Trinity College Library in Dublin, and this dates back to the early 1700s. This is a library that's home to more than 200,000 historical texts, and you can see that, um, that they're housed uh, on two levels here with this open aisle down the center. So once again, this has this kind of interesting association to, to um, uh, religious architecture as well. And we have this beautiful barrel vaulted ceiling here too. Now note for a second, just how tall these bookshelves are here. Um, uh, the average person would probably stand right about here. How are you going to access these, um, these really tall shelves? Accessibility is always really interesting to me. Well, each one of these little bays has its own completely romantic, beautiful uh, staircase. Who among us hasn't imagined or fantasized about having a personal life Library with a little staircase like this, a little ladder that you can use to access the books. So um, here's just one other view of, of, of this same library. You can see that there are these roped off sections here. This library is actually the home of the Book of Kells, uh, a really famous manuscript. And, um, and, and so this is a rare image where there aren't a, a lot of people milling through to see some of the pages from the Book of Kells. If you're a Star Wars fan by chance, this is a space that might look really familiar to you because it was the inspiration for the Jedi archives from one of the, the, the Star Wars movies. So that's really important to somebody like my husband. <laughs> 
<laughs> so now we're still moving through history on this guided tour of, of the evolution of libraries. And now we are looking at a, an example of, a, of an Austrian library from the late 1700s. So this was designed right around the time that America was declaring its independence. And we can see this is a really different approach to, um, to the even just the basic concept of a library. I feel like it's a sort of an expansion on, um, on Michelangelo's thinking that, that the space of a library can really kind of transform your, um, your experience learning, studying, reading. And so in this library over here on the right, which is called the Admont Library, it is part of, a, of a, an abbey that dates back to the, the, the medieval period. But as I said, this was designed in the late 1700s. So what we see here is this full integration of art and really kind of elaborate architecture. We've got undulating bookcases. We've got frescoes on the ceiling. The, um, the space itself is not dominated by the bookshelves, but it instead is, um, is all about this aesthetic experience that you're having while you're visiting. So, um, so, so certainly kind of taking a note from Michelangelo and expanding upon it. Here's just another view of that same library. I mean, it's, it's, it's visual, it's, it's eye candy, right? It's visual splendor in so many ways. So we'll round out this, this first half of our library history by turning away from the Rococo style to something that is much more um, neoclassical in its nature. By the time we get to the British Library Museum or the British Museum Library, I should say, we are in the, the neoclassical style. And, um, and so we're talking about using rational spaces, basic geometries like circles and squares. So this reading room here was, um, it was an architectural wonder for the time, but they are very consciously trying to quote the classical past. This is a reading room that is about, I think, 142 feet wide. And they are thinking specifically of the Pantheon that was made out of concrete uh, going back to ancient Rome. So, uh, so quoting the classical past, but in this case, using modern, um, modern, modern materials like, like steel and glass in order to create this, this beautiful dome. Incidentally, this reading room was really the, an iconic destination for the literary landscape in London. So it's it's this massive, impressive space, to, uh, not just to house books, but to bring people together around them. So now let's shift gears. And um, we have this kind of foundation now for, for what libraries have looked like. Well, what do they look like in America? And why do they look the way they look? Uh, just a brief trip back to the, the the McKim Building at the Boston Public Library in Copley Square. Uh, it's important to know that, that uh, early libraries, early significant libraries in America were designed because they were really thought of, um, of uh, thought of as being integral to any civilized nation's self-identity and a necessary resource for an informed citizenry as well. So as I mentioned, there were these major building campaigns at the end of the 19th century and in the um, early 20th century. Uh, libraries like this were often built um, in conjunction with with um, with art museums, so right in Copley Square, the old Museum of Fine Arts building was just perpendicular to this building here. So, um, so this would have been a cultural center had the had the MFA not moved. So, the Boston Public Library is really the first large free municipal library in the United States, the first public library to lend books, and the first to have a branch library too. So, it it, it has this really uh, a number of significant firsts here. But um, but that experience inside, this notion of, of creating a palace for the people really sets the tone for what a lot of um, uh, uh, American libraries might look like. So just a few years after the, the Boston Public Library was made, New York City wants to sort of, uh, uh, you know, make a statement in terms of, of the architecture of their own library too. So this was designed in 1902 by Carrera and Hastings, and it was the largest marble structure ever attempted in the US at this time. We've got another temple-like facade here with this projecting porch and these 
recessed uh, portals, these three portals. I mean, this this is a, a design that you know takes us all the way back to ancient Rome. Um, and of course, when we're talking about the New York City Public Library, you've got the lions out front. We saw the lions inside the Boston Public Library. They're sitting out front in New York and they've become icons for the entire institution. They fundraise off of the lions. The lions have their own identities um, that have changed over the years. But I think um, as of late, they, I think, are known as like Lady Astor and, and Master Lennox, um, even though they're both male lions with manes. <laughs> so, so they've become really the mascots of, of the New York City Public Library and, you know, by association for libraries in general. But when we head inside the New York Public Library, they also have an expansive reading room. This is the Rose Reading Room that we see over here on the left. It's much, much larger larger than, um, than the reading room that we saw in Boston, but it is just as beautifully appointed. So the idea here is that you need some research materials, you head to this desk, they pull the materials for you as quickly as possible, and then you can go and sit down in the Rose Reading Room to access those materials. So th the New York City Public Library used uh, state-of-the-art technology in order to make those materials as as accessible as possible. So we're looking at this kind of cutaway drawing of the stacks of the New York Public Library, which go down seven stories. And they are, um, and there's these elaborate pulley systems and almost like a, a train system that gets these books right back up to the Rose Reading Room as quickly as possible. So it was um, it was really relying on, on cutting edge technology to make these libraries work as effectively as they do. Other major examples in the United States include the, um, the Library of Congress, which is definitely on my bucket list. I haven't had a chance to visit in, it in person yet, but the Library of Congress was, um, was initially just that. It was a library just for Congress. It was based on the, the, um, the private library of Thomas Jefferson. So this is known as the Jefferson Building today, but the building itself wasn't, um, wasn't designed or, or opened until the end of the 19th century. It was designed by John Smithmeyer, and it was the largest library in the world. It is now the largest library collection in the world, and it has 170 million items. They are not all housed in this one building, but certainly a lot of them are. So um, the design was based on the Paris Opera House of all things, which is you know yet another example of this beautiful neoclassical or Beaux-Arts design. When we're looking at it from the street, we can see a lot of familiar elements here, the projecting porch, the three central doors over here, the Corinthian columns. We can just see the top of the dome projecting up behind it. And there is a golden flame at the top of the dome that represents um, uh, the, the knowledge. So, uh, you know, everything about the exterior of the building is, is designed as this temple to learning, this temple to democracy. And, um, and, and, and so it, we see these elements that, that have been echoing around for the past century or so in the design. When you head inside underneath that dome is the famous reading room. Room. So just like at the Rose uh, Reading Room in the New York City Public Library, if you're doing research, you're not necessarily going into the stacks yourself. You would um, uh, request something from the librarian at the center here. They would retrieve it. And you could sit here in this gorgeous sort of uh, golden bronze space with these big muscular uh, um, piers and columns and get your research done there. If you've ever seen All the President's Men, that's where all the research was being done in the movie. And people, of course, are going on tours in these upper galleries looking down at you. So the, the biggest impact or, or, or biggest influence, I should say, on most American libraries are not necessarily these um, these really large institutions. Instead, it was Andrew Carnegie and, and his decision to, to uh, make a huge investment in public learning. So here we're looking at a portrait of Andrew Carnegie. It dates to about 1905. It's at the National Portrait Gallery. We don't know who the artist was. And we're looking at the main branch of the Pittsburgh Public Library here, which he helped, uh, he probably funded in its entirety. This also says free to all people above the three 
three portals here. So, um, so based on 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 precedents uh, that already existed in in the country. So it's worth noting that Andrew Carnegie, 1901, he was the richest man in the world, but he also decided that. Um, it was up to him to give away his fortune. He actually believed that the man who dies rich dies in disgrace. So he ends up giving away 90% of his fortune, about $350 million, uh, primarily funding churches, uh, libraries, academic institutions around the world. And he is um, helping to pioneer the concept of free public services. So, um, So this was his philanthropic mission. And he ends up funding the construction of about 2,500 libraries worldwide, almost 1,700 of them were built in the United States. And there's one um, sort of interesting postscript just to him and and Pittsburgh in particular, because he does the main library branch, but he also funds a few of the other branches. And while the entire city wasn't um, able to access uh, uh, libraries easily, he funded this program that, that was an outreach program where these libraries, these these little libraries existed in these boxes and they would go to homes and neighborhoods that didn't have branch libraries yet. And a volunteer would would visit um, these homes weekly and read to the children and talk about the books and tell stories. I think it's a really interesting um, uh, outreach uh, program and we'll see how, um, how there are things that are still sort of similar that are happening today. So there's so much uh, influence that comes from the building of all of these libraries uh, from Carnegie's uh, money. We're looking at two Massachusetts libraries here again. This is the Taunton Public Library over here on the left. It's designed in 1902 by the architect Albert Randolph Ross. It's sort of a Beaux-Arts design. I think it it looks a lot like a bank to me. Over on the right is the Rockland Public Library uh, designed in 1903 by the firm McLean and and write. And this is kind of a Georgian revival style library. Now, one of the things that that, uh, almost all of these Carnegie libraries have in common, and both of these libraries have in common too, is the staircase leading up and the light and the the the, the lights just beside the door, uh, so that's that connection back to Michelangelo and the staircase, the flame of knowledge that exists here. So, um, so I want to talk just very briefly about how Carnegie funded these these libraries because he really believed in giving money to industrious and ambitious people. So you had to kind of lobby for these grants. Um, He wanted to help people who were really looking to help themselves. So we have to give a lot of credit actually to women's clubs uh, post-Civil War because they were the ones that were organizing and saying that their communities needed resources like this. Um, so, So we have a lot of women to thank for these libraries. They're, they're kind of unsung heroes in many ways. So uh, once Andrew Carnegie would uh, give you a grant, uh, your library did not have restrictions in terms of what it looked like. It could be Beaux-Arts, it could be Italian Renaissance, it could be Baroque, it could really be anything. That was determined by the community. But one thing that that happened kind of early on that, that alarmed uh, Andrew Carnegie was that um, that one of uh, of the libraries that he gave a grant to just looked a little too ornate. It looked like too much money had been spent on it. So eventually he and his assistant, really his assistant, I should say, uh, come up with some basic plans that most libraries could use for their design. So they could sort of, uh, it's almost like having a catalog of libraries that, that you could that you could choose from. So almost every Carnegie library looks the same or is organized the same inside, even though the facade of it might have a different style. And what's really interesting to me is that, um, that, uh, the, these designs were so influential and you have such a limited number of architects who are working on these designs that uh, Carnegie libraries are sort of indistinguishable from non-Carnegie libraries. So for example, here's my hometown library again in Manchester, New Hampshire. Here's the public library in Springfield, Mass, designed by the same architect, but in this case, um, the architect had funding from Carnegie. So he uses you know, essentially the same concepts when he's building a non carnegie Library. That's just to, to note, I mean, the incredible influence this kind of investment had in American culture. Now, one 
quick note on um, on the social politics around these libraries, because uh, Andrew Carnegie would fund these libraries really without any restriction, including giving money to communities in southern states that um, that were still segregated communities. So what we're looking at over here is the Savannah Public Library in Georgia, one of these beautiful um, neoclassical designs with with the ionic columns here. But if there was a black community that was also as ambitious and as industrious as these women's groups, they could lobby uh, Andrew Carnegie for, for their own segregated library within the same community. So this is a Carnegie funded library that was uh, just for the black community in Savannah, Georgia. And incidentally, uh, so I, it, it, this one opened in 1914 just to serve black residents. Uh, incidentally, one of our Supreme Court justices Tom, uh, 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 Clarence Thomas grew up going to this segregated library in Savannah, Georgia. He talked about it in his memoir. So it's pretty interesting to think about, you know, he had the power, he had the, the finances to, he could have said, you know, you can build a library, but make it integrated, but he sort of perpetuated um, these, these uh, really kind of tragic uh, modes in, in, um, in Southern society. So um, it's interesting to, to think of, 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 the, of the kind of lingering effects of, of just these, uh, these, these segregated services in particular. All right, so let's turn our attention to, to things that get a little bit more experimental, a little bit more fun, and we begin to see this in the 20th century. We have this Carnegie mold, but we have a few uh, architects and a few libraries that are willing to break from the mold. The Brooklyn Public Library is one such institution. Um, initially, they were going to have a Carnegie-like uh, uh, design, but their, their building project stalled out for a decade or more, I believe. So this was completed in 1941. And instead of looking neoclassical or Georgian revival, what we have here is something quasi Egyptian. We've got these interesting columns at the front door, but the building itself almost looks as though we're looking at the spine of a book that is then opening up. And this kind of um, architectural suggestion we'll, we'll see becomes more and more popular um, in, in, in recent years for us. Another favorite and really innovative design that we see in the 20th century is the, the um, Yale University Rare Books Library, the Beinecke Library. And a lot of this innovative design that's happening is happening on academic campuses, I should say. I mean, they have the money to, to hire some of the best architects. So this design is from 1963. If you've never been to the Beinecke Rare Book Library, put it on your bucket list right now. It doesn't look really impressive from the outside, does it? <laughs> um, it doesn't have any windows. The the ground level floor here, this is all glass. But when you walk inside this building, this, this marble building, um, inside it glows because each of the marble, um, marble panels here are cut very, very thin. And so they're actually translucent, but it diminishes the light enough that the rare books inside this building are fully protected. Um, actually, there's a whole other layer of protection here because they are inside a glass case here that can like suck out the air if there's ever a fire in this building. So it's uh, it's really an otherworldly, a very exquisite experience to walk in this building that looks so weighty, but then inside feels so ethereal. Another academic library from the 20th century that has was innovative in so many ways is the Phillips Exeter Library in Exeter, New Hampshire. This was designed by Louis Kahn in 1971. It's a really unassuming exterior here. He's using brick, he's matching um, with, with the aesthetic of the school in general. And he had some pretty major building limitations on him. Um, he the, the building itself wasn't supposed to be more than I think four stories high and we'll see how he gets a, a, around this. But he's, he's um, very thoughtful in the way that books would be housed and the way that students would use these books. So you go inside and, um, and he has prioritized natural lighting for the study carols here. 
And sort of like airplane windows, you can move those wooden panels to modulate how much light you want and need as you're studying. You can also look outside and have the most pleasant distraction ever looking around the Phillips Exeter Academy um, campus. And you'll notice just set back from these huge windows here is um, are, are essentially the stacks and they are two stories high. So really every story of this building is two stories. The, every, every story has a mezzanine. So it ends up being closer to nine stories high than, than the four stories required by the zoning committee of, um, of, of the city. So it was a, an interesting workaround, but the central atrium of this same library at Phillips Exeter is really just awe inspiring. And you walk in through a ground level and you, and you go up a staircase into this central space where he is using concrete, a really sort of unexpected material, raw and rough, and he matches it with this beautiful wood that houses the stacks here. And they're all kind of um, close to this central atrium, protecting it from the, 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 the light of the exterior windows. Uh, he's broken it down into these basic geometries, these big circular cutouts, the X at the top of the building. And it's an awe-inspiring space. I highly recommend visiting this library if you get the chance. And you can just wander in and look around. So uh, as we reach the 21st century, we begin to see real, um, well, real courage when it comes to being experimental and a, a new understanding in terms of the role that library architecture can have and its value to a city. What we're looking at here is Salt Lake City's main library. It was designed by Moshe Stafti in 2003. Now, this has become a top destination for people visiting this city. It's like, uh, it, it's the must-see spot. And, and I want to show you a little bit as to why. Uh, we're using modern materials here. Obviously, we've got glass and steel and concrete. But what we're looking at is a, a building with a massive ramp that leads up to the top and a rooftop garden and absolutely spectacular views of the mountains. So this is understood not just to be uh, a home for books and resources, but it is, um, it's, a, it's a community center that is welcoming to everybody that is in Salt Lake City. And so you can walk up that ramp. This is the same ramp that we see over here, access the rooftop gardens, have this delightful experience. Inside the library itself, the main floor actually has shops and we can see the upper stories have the stacks over here. I'm not especially a fan of the interior of the library. I think it looks a lot like a mall, but we see somebody who's thinking about libraries in new ways and thinking about how they engage with, with the public. Uh, somebody mentioned at the start of the program today, the Seattle Public Library being a favorite uh, library for them. This is one that's become pretty controversial in the past few years. This is, was designed in 2004, and there was a ton of money poured into this project because you have you know all this tech in Seattle that was willing to, um, to help support this. It's an 11 story high glass and steel building in downtown uh, uh, Seattle. And um, the New Yorker, when it was done, declared this library the most important new library to be built in a generation and said it was the most exhilarating. It definitely created more foot traffic in downtown. It created all of this, this kind of economic boom in the area uh, and a huge increase in terms of of um, public usage of the library too. But within the space of a few years, people began to think of it in different ways too. This is sort of like a, a cutaway of the library itself. It, it, what's so interesting to me is like every angle that you look at it from, it turns, it looks like a different building. So we can see that, um, that the interior spaces are a little discombobulated, a little bit hard to understand. But you can also see from the image over here on the left that there are lines outside of this building. This is not a building that's lined with doors. It's not an easily accessible building. There's a couple of main doors and it's kind of hard to get in into if you're just on the street. So it's been criticized in that way. If we're looking at uh, the main spaces down here, we can see that there aren't really kind of divisions for traditional spaces. 
that we would find inside of a library. So the stacks are kind of open to these meeting spaces, to a dining space. This yellow escalator here um, is uh, translates to this yellow escalator over in this image. It's all even open to an auditorium space. So you can imagine sound just rattling around in this space. Uh, the threat that the food offers to the stacks over here. To me, these are really strange design decisions. And it all kind of came around to, um, to, to kind of bite Seattle in the butt because architects began to kind of backtrack their praise for this institution. The architectural critic for the Seattle Post Intelligencer um, looked back at this building three years later and he found it, quote, confusing, impersonal, uncomfortable, oppressive, on the whole with various features, decidedly unpleasant, relentlessly monotonous, badly designed and cheesily detailed, profoundly dreary and depressing, and cheaply finished or dysfunctional, concluding that his earlier praise for the building was a mistake. So sometimes new can just be um, awe-inspiring, but, but the actual reality of these buildings, once they set in, are not always, um, don't always work with, with the practical necessities of, of, a, of a lending library. Sometimes new and novel architecture works really well. We're looking at the Central Library in Calgary um, in Canada. This was designed by the firm Snohetta in um, 2018. And this, this main arch that we see in this image over here is supposedly inspired by this cloud formation that is typical to this, air, to this region of Canada. We can see that the panels just above it uh, sort of dissolve into glass windows. And some of those panels that are dissolving look like they are in the form of books, like flying books. And some of those books hook together Together to look like they are structures, that they're houses, and then those houses link together. So it's a really kind of interesting transformation or transition from, um, from opaque wall to sheer glass over here and sort of suggestive of the role that a library has. Now, whenever you... Um, photograph uh, any uh, any new building at night with this kind of glowing light inside, they always look great. But this image shows to you too that it is uh, situated in the hub, and it's also sited in an area that kind of brings these two disparate uh, parts of the city together. They talked about this building as like healing a wound between these two sections of town. And inside, um, the materials used are absolutely beautiful. There's, um, there's an intentionality in the division of space here, and it's supposed to move from like fun on the first floor up to the fourth floor where it's more serious research. So you can see at the ground level, the staircases are designed to, um, to, to double as like auditorium seating in some ways. So uh, it looks like a really fun, beautiful place to, to, to spend some time and dwell in if you get the chance to go up there in Canada. Now, some communities really fall short when they are designing or redesigning their public libraries. This is the public library in Edmonton, Alberta. And it was um, a very much talked about remodeled library. Essentially what they decided to do was to strip away the exterior of the building and try to um, install something that was more um, artsy, something that aligned more with, with the artsy district in downtown um, Edmonton. So they rebuilt it in 2020, just removing these exterior walls. And the public response to what they got has been overwhelmingly negative. I love this tweet here where it says, this is what they were expecting. These were the architectural renderings. And it says the dating profile pic versus the dude who's sitting across the table from you. This has been compared to a dumpster, <laughs> um, a tank, but overall um, the, the public is, is not pleased with it. And it's certainly not not a building that that necessarily beckons you to come in. The interior spaces are sort of interesting, but those are the spaces that, that didn't really change. Uh, another instance of maybe an architectural design that didn't quite work um, is this building here. I, I actually really like the exterior of it. We're looking at a library at the Brandenburg Technical University in Cottbus, Germany. And so this was designed by Herzog and Demur in 2004. It's this 
really unusual amoeba shaped uh, 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 building. I believe it's about seven stories high. And instead of having discrete windows here. It's almost like a building made out of glass, but it's got this, this um, bizarre kind of fascinating scrim that goes over it all around the building. And if you have really good eyes, you can sort of see that the scrim looks like it's covered in writing or in these in glyphs really, because it's indecipherable, but it sort of signals to any visitor that, that inside there's text, there's resources here. Um, and, and we get a sense of the scale here because we've got the the little car in front. But um, but as interesting and, and as intriguing as it may be from the outside, the design choices inside <laughs> were not met with, um, with, with a lot of fans from, from the students of this university. There's a lot of students uh, writing, complaining online about the lime green, hot pink color scheme that they chose. It is not the kind of place where you want to sit and spend a lot of time because these colors can be really offensive to the senses, but apparently they were selected to be used for, for wayfinding. Um, I'm always a big fan of wayfinding but in this case, I think the, the color choices might have been a mistake. So one other library that um, that is, is sort of in the works that I think has ruffled a lot of feathers and might be an architectural misstep is this one here. This is the planned library for the picturesque city of Prague. This is sometimes known as the octopus or the blob. Believe it or not, it was the unanimous decision by a jury following an international competition competition for um, an innovative new design. This would be the first major building added to Prague, I think since the 1800s. And so um, ever since this international competition in 2007, this project has been stalled out because you can imagine there's a lot of people um, working against this, uh, think that it would be um, just a real mismatch with the architecture of this city. So we'll round out this section here with, um, with a library that recently opened in New York City um, in Long Island. And, um, and it's, it's a building that's been heralded for its um, architectural innovation, but we're also going to look at, at some of the ways that it might have, um, might have been a misstep. <laughs> so this is Hunter's Point Library in, uh, sorry, this is in Queens. And it was designed by Stephen Hole Architects, opened in um, 2019. It took um, 15 years to complete this project. It's a public building. It's New York City. There was a lot of red tape and it came at the very hefty price tag of $41 million. But people loved it when it was open. The New York Times critic said the library is among the finest and most uplifting public buildings New York has produced so far this century. Here's another view of it. It was heralded as a stunning architectural marvel. Looking back at the library from New York City, you can see it right here. Um, in front of these skyscrapers. It was also called a beacon of learning and literacy and culture. But one major problem with it is that it was actually, wheel it was not wheelchair accessible. So we can see here that there are multiple stacks here. I think, I believe this is adult fiction, the adult fiction section, that if you're, you know, using a wheelchair or a walker, or if you have a baby in a stroller, you just can't get to it. There are actually a few other spots, even within the children's room, that are inaccessible if you have any sort of mobility issues. So you can imagine um, spending that amount of time, that amount of money in order to get a great public library. And then all of a sudden there's a massive public outcry and a lawsuit, a class action lawsuit, um, so, so that people who, who, have, who have mobility issues can actually um, access the, the materials that are supposed to be democratically accessible to them. So we'll round uh, things out uh, with, uh, with this next section here, the invitations to engage. And I think it's worth noting that it, it's just been in the past few decades that you have um, libraries and museums coming under this one umbrella with the Institute of Library and Museums, uh, uh, in IMLS, Institute of Museum and Library Services. So I think in recent decades, we've seen interesting cross-pollination in the way that libraries and museums, art museums, children's museums engage with the public. So, um, so not even on, a, on, a, on an architectural note, we're thinking about 
both kinds of institutions are thinking about engaging with the public in new ways. This is an image here to represent the concept of a concierge librarian. And I'm sure most librarians think of themselves in this way to begin with, but this was a program promoted to the public by multiple institutions. This idea that you could really sit down with a librarian, talk to them about who you are, what you need, what you're looking to accomplish, and they are focused 100% on you, and they're going to delve into this project with you. Um, librarians have always been really innovative in terms of the way that they promote books or engage the public with new reading. Uh, blind date with a book is something that I've seen a lot of lately, but I also like these books were banned, find out why. Um, inviting people to engage with the collections in different ways. And then we see this, um, this kind of innovative engagement uh, reflected in some of the architectural designs in recent years. So we already saw the community bookshelf in Kansas City. This is another uh, perspective out of it with a few more um, uh, titles that we can see here. And, um, and, and uh, that's, those are pretty much the same titles that we saw on the title page. But even inside the museum, the walls of the library, the steps inside the library look like you're, you know, like you're a little bug inside um, on, on the stacks of the library. You're engaging with, um, with these books on this kind of fantastic level. You almost feel like you're Alice in Wonderland walking through these spaces. And so there are multiple institutions that have taken a note from this kind of design. Design. This is, um, I believe, the Duluth Public Library, designed in 1980, where the entrance down below has the spines of all of these books. So you feel like you're really stepping inside of a story. Um, this has been extended out to uh, the Philadelphia Airport, believe it or not. They, they have a, a, a branch, essentially, for the library at the airport, complete with the, you know, the massive spines for these books, inviting people to get a library card, use their hotspot, and even... Uh, uh, borrow some library or some, some books while you're there. Uh, we see a similar design in Turkey as well. Uh, sometimes the design extends to sculptures and that sort of thing. This is a sculpture that is at the British Library in London. It's called Sitting on History from 1995. So it's a book in the shape of a bench where, where you can sort of sit on this book. Interestingly enough, it's a book that is chained to this heavy ball here. So it sort of reminds me of the chained libraries that we saw earlier on from decades before. And not necessarily a part of library history that I would necessarily celebrate. Um, other ways libraries are, are sort of taking um, interesting opportunities to engage. This is inside the Denver Public Library. And one of the, the interesting things that they did there was they have um, a visible, uh, uh, well, a, a visible book return. If you're like me, every time I go and return my book at a library, I always start thinking about who picks up this book? Where does it go? What's the whole process like? Are they going to pick it up before five so I won't get a fine? At the Denver Public Library, you walk in, you slide your book into the, through this slot, it goes onto a conveyor belt, and you see this whole kind of semi-mechanized process about what happens to your book after you return it. Makes it, makes it kind of fun to return a book. Um, <clears throat> Children's libraries, uh, the children's rooms of libraries have become destinations in recent years, and they look more like children's museums than children's museums do today. Um, this is a library in Singapore over here. The dinosaur one is in California. The castle is from Charlotte, North Carolina. And then um, down below, this is from Wyoming. So we see all of these beautiful kind of engaging spaces, very interactive, and they kind of facilitate this environmental literacy that we're only really now just starting to prioritize. Um, some of these children's librarians have also been commissioning works like, um, well, public sculpture works like the ones that we see here at the library at Chapel Hill in, um, in North Carolina. And so in this case, they commissioned these animals like the, the rabbit and the snake and the tortoise and the frog because they exist in so many children's 
books. And these sculptures have become almost like those mascots that we saw um, with libraries being built about a hundred years ago. They are other places, other ways to engage with the, um, with the mission of the library. A few other sculptures, really interesting sculptures, just to wrap up, we have um, this kind of sinking library here. This is in uh, Melbourne, Australia. It's called Architectural Fragment. But we see the neoclassical library of the past sinking into the ground as though into quicksand or lava. It's like dissolving before our very eyes. Perhaps we're witnessing the last gasps of, um, of, of the traditional notion of what a library is. It's the respectable edifice of a bygone era. It's an opportunity for us to think of libraries in a new way. Um, in Bulgaria, we see more instances of these uh, book benches, not too far from the public library there. This is a stacked book tower. I believe this is in Prague and um, really just designed for Instagram, uh, Instagram opportunities opportunities like you see here, but it pulls people in. Um, and then everybody loves a good book staircase. So over here on the left, we have the Northfield Public Library in Mi Northfield, Minnesota. They just painted their steps to look like the spines of popular books. And that's something that people are doing in their own homes these days. Uh, we feel so connected to these texts. Why not kind of live with them and innovate in the space that we, that we inhabit? So we will wrap up today with um, little libraries and their relationship to these bigger architectural uh, um, issues and concerns that we've been talking about all along. So little libraries, free little libraries, this is a nonprofit that is based in Hudson, Wisconsin, and their mission is to be a catalyst for building communities and inspiring readers. So they prompt people to build a little structure, <laughs> create a little structure, or um, uh, essentially co-opt a little structure to create a free lending library in uh, on your property, in your community. And so, um, so because this is all part of a network, you will be tied into a map that people can access and learn where other free little libraries are. So it's a way to share the books that you love. It's also got a really interesting relationship back to those uh, Carnegie Library books. Uh, boxes of books that he was sending out into neighborhoods that couldn't necessarily access libraries easily. During the pandemic, um, free little libraries turned into food pantries for some. I love that there's even toilet paper in this one because we all know how scarce that was for a little while. But I mean, even on a day like today when it's sweltering hot in the Northeast, I mean, libraries are sanctuaries for people that need to get out of the heat. So it makes sense that, that a free little library like this would become a community resource in the same way that actual libraries are. So free little libraries, they uh, encourage people to be creative in the design of, of the libraries themselves. I think occasionally people are actually thinking about um, uh, a real life human scale library design too, but sometimes these designs get really wacky and over the top. It's all in good fun. But if you can't decide what you want your free little library to look like, just like Andrew Carnegie, they have plans for you. So, so a lot of little libraries look the same because there are instructions for building them. Um, so they can become um, sort of easy to identify that way. Uh, all right, so we've covered a lot of ground here. We've taken up a, a good hour of your day. So our big ideas, our big conclusive ideas, the, the, some of our takeaways for today, the fundamental role of a library has always been about sharing knowledge and making connections. Historically, architecturally, significant buildings have been designed to reflect that sacred role in civic life, echoing in so many ways the architecture of art museums and other important institutions. Today, we've looked at buildings that exalt different facets of, of a library's role. Some of them exalt the fact that um, their role is to protect collections, whether they're chaining these books or um, are keeping them protected from sunlight. Uh, some of these libraries are are focused on the artwork inside the aesthetic experience that you would have when you enter them. Other libraries that we've seen are all about innovative design, whether it's spanning enormous spaces like this or using, 
or not even using uh, <laughs> uh, square corners for any of your rooms. Um, it's, it's an opportunity for people to experiment and get creative. And then finally, we've seen a lot of uh, library designs that, uh, that are invitations to engage and interact with the public in, in brand new ways or invitations really to connect as a community. So as we round out, we can just sort of focus on this notion that um, there is no one right way to build a library. And so hopefully in the years to come, we'll see many new reinventions for this form. Um, some of them I'm sure will be crowd pleasers and some of them I'm sure will, uh, will raise hackles, but I will end there for now. And I welcome any questions or comments you might have about library architecture. See a lot in the chat here. There might be a lot to cover here, Robert. <laughs> I'm going to run through them, Jane. We'll okay. go for about 10 more minutes. Um, so Gail says, truly terrific armchair tour of libraries, their history and architecture. I love this presentation and uplifting talk for our current times. Uh, Lucy also loved the lecture. Joyce said, excellent presentation of the diversity of library architecture. I had no idea. So thank you. Uh, Judy says, uh, Jane, uh, you knocked it out of the park once again. Big thanks to you for an outstanding presentation. Wow, thank you. <laughs> uh, Gail notes that her city's libraries are public cooling centers this week. Yep. They're truly community centric. They are. Uh, they Lucy, are. Yeah. Uh, Lucy says, uh, retired librarian here. Uh, when our department was redesigned, the librarians met with the designers and we gave input and the final result was beautiful and practical. That's good uh, to hear. You don't always you don't always hear that. <laughs> no, you don't. Uh, Renee wants to know: Have you seen the Croc Library at Cornell University for rare and manuscript collections? No. If not, you may want to check it out. It has very interesting architecture. All right, I will put that on my list. Thank you. Uh, P, uh, maybe Pat says, thank you, Jane, for another wonderful, informative, and enjoyable presentation. Uh, Gail notes that the Newton Library has Nancy Sean children's sculptures outside, nice. and the Concord Library in Massachusetts just opened a new children's library. Wonderful. Uh, Eva Jane says, I love everything Jane presents, but this is uh, closest to my heart since books have been part of my life since I was a toddler wanting my grandmother to read to me. <laughs> there we go. Uh, Marie says, so interesting. Thank you, Jane, for your research and enthusiasm. I loved it. Uh, Ron says, simply fantastic presentation as always. Wow. Uh, Renee would like to know, uh, could you please talk more about how newer library spaces are adapting to become more community centers to bring people in? And that actually relates to another question yeah. from Joyce, who says, uh, and I know you actually touched on this at the end here. Uh, Joyce asks, what does Jane think of the current library uh, trend um, that uh, places uh, less emphasis on housing physical books and periodicals mm -hmm. and more on making room for social gatherings, such as community meeting rooms and gift shops and cafes? Believe it or not, that that what seems like a novel trend is actually right in line with what Andrew Carnegie was promoting about a hundred years ago with those um, recommended designs. Um, we could go back to that really quickly and you'll see that he gives over so much square footage of his libraries to gathering spaces. They're actually great designs for 21st century libraries because there are big tables to spread out in. There's very little space for stacks and storage. So it's interesting to think that um, maybe for the past century or so, we've operated under this assumption that it has to be about collecting, that the collections have to be right there on site. But Carnegie's notion was that the collections, um, well, they would be lo loaned out, a lot of them, <laughs> and um, and that 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 these uh, these institutions functioning as social hubs, gathering spaces, community centers was just as important as as how to, housing the books and information. So we've come a little bit full circle that way. And I personally am absolutely in favor of anything that brings people into these spaces, because if a coffee shop gets somebody to walk into a library for the very first time, that's a win <laughs> because they'll probably start browsing the collections. So um, 
So I think, I think it's, it's a great creative way to think about engaging more people and serving people from where they are too. You know, if what they need is a coffee shop inside their, their library, then like, let's make it happen if that's the barrier to participation. So um, I'm in favor of that. There's a whole other, and, and I'm not an expert in this area, but there's certainly a whole other debate about um, the stacks and, and where all of, you know, the periodicals for the past, you know, a few hundreds of years, where should they be? Um, I know that New York City Public Library was was thinking about moving all of that off site so that you couldn't just go to that Rose reading room and immediately get, you know, a magazine from 1918 or something like that. So um, in the in the era of digitization, you know, this is a complicated issue. And uh, like I said, maybe I'm not the expert to weigh in on that, but I do think it's great to bring in um sort of other uh, other aspects of modern life into these library spaces. And I think librarians do a great job in terms of programming and um, inviting people in that way. So we see it with the programs, maybe not necessarily with the architecture yet. <laughs> Yes, I, uh, so a few more comments and recommendations. Um, um, Ron says, thanks, Jane. Uh, he recommends checking out the new Smith College Library. Okay. Um, yeah. And then uh, Diane, who knows I can't pronounce French, let alone English, uh, recommends a uh, art library in Paris called the Centre... Pompidou. Yeah. Thank you, Pompidou. Jane. Pompidou, yep. <laughs> if you say so. Has unique architecture for its period and is an interesting yeah. place to visit. Uh, Nancy says this presentation was an even more ex was even more excellent than I had hoped. Uh, so much fun. Uh, Woburn, a couple of notes on Woburn. Woburn has a modern addition um, to the iconic Richardson designed library. Although it was initially controversial, it was well done and well received. Uh, mm -hmm. Judy uh, um, says, uh, do you have any idea if the Peterborough, New Hampshire library was one of the first in the nation? Judy, I have heard something like that, but offhand, I'm not completely sure. I remember trying to track down the, all of the firsts for the Boston Public Library, and I thought they were the first everything, but of course they're not. I'm not sure if Peterborough is, but um, I will look into that for sure. I'll also uh, give a shout out to the Medford Library, my hometown library. They recently redid their library with funding provided from uh, former New York mayor, Michael Bloomberg, who was a Medford native. And I believe that came out uh, very well, though I have not visited it in person yet. Mm -hmm. uh, Renee uh, notes the Carnegie Libraries also had an apartment for the library caretaker. Mm -hmm. I would love to have lived in one of those. That's so cool. I, I remember reading that there were apartments at the New York City Public Library, but I didn't know the Carnegie Libraries had that. Yeah, I feel like that would be hot real estate these days. <laughs> uh, Gail says uh, uh, she'd love to watch even more on this topic and hopes you can create a part two. Uh, Linda recommends the Camden, Maine Public Library. She says mm. it's beautiful. And Gail wants to know, I know we've... Uh, I know uh, Harry Potter has taken some hits lately because of uh, the author there, but Gail would like to know uh, which library was the Hogwarts library based on? Any idea? That's a good question. I don't know offhand. Um, uh, it might be a, a real mix. It's, I, I, I'm sorry. I don't know offhand, but I'll, I'll that will be in part two. For part sure. two, we'll, we'll talk about all the uh, all the famous libraries from, uh, from art and from uh, uh, movies and television and, and literature. All right. So, Jane, I think uh, we've addressed all comments and questions, at least all the comments that came in within the last 20 minutes. I'm sure I missed some at the beginning. But why don't we wrap it here? Do, do you have any last words for the group? Just thank you so much for spending your time with me today. And maybe you'll look into uh, the, the back, the history of your own public library a little bit more too. It's always fun to, to know if it's a Car Carnegie library or not. There we go. So we will see uh, Jane uh, next uh, month. Uh, uh, look for an email from me tomorrow with information about that art history program, plus all the other art history programs we're hosting. Uh, and then in addition, uh, you'll receive the recording and a link to a feedback survey. Please take 30 seconds and fill that out. Let us know what you thought of the event and what you'd like to see for future topics. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jane. Thank you to the audience. I hope everyone stays cool. I'm about to go stand outside for four hours. Wish me luck. Uh, I hope everyone has a great rest of their day. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Bye, Jane. Thanks again.